happy to get hold of you. So thank you very much for both parties. And we'll now call our next witnesses, the Australian and International Pilots Association via video conference. So gentlemen, I can see you on the screen. Can you see us? Okay, we'll get you to unmute if you could. Thanks very much. And I'll now ask you to give your uh, name and the capacity in which you appear today. Just need to demute. Can, can you hear us all right? If you take it off, I, I don't know if you're off mute. Can you hear us? I can hear you. Oh, good. Well, you can start with, and I can see Captain McCarris there. So if you just would like to give us your name and the capacity in which you appear today. So, uh, Dick McCarris, um, I'm the Technical and Safety and Regulatory Affairs Advisor for APA, and the two gentlemen who are yet to unmute uh, Captain Murray Butt, the President of APA, and Captain Barry Jackson, the Vice President of APA. Thank you, Captain. And I'll just while we've got you there, have we got the Australian Licensed Aircraft Engineers Association on teleconference as well? Not yet. I'm sure they'll come in and they'll let us know when they do uh, arrive. Well, uh, Captain McCarris, I'm going to go to you because you can hear us and we can hear you and give you the opportunity to make an opening statement. And if the other two captains uh, want to join in after, please just uh, chime in. Uh, we're just wondering if you could hear us now. Yep. Now you yep, we can hear you. Got us now. Okay. 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 Captain McCarris. No, it's still I think it's appropriate for the for the president to make that opening statement. So yeah, I'll just don't. step to the background again. My apologies, uh, Captain Butt. Uh, thank you very much. I might just point out that we are the only ones in the office because the rest of our staff are um, made arrangements to stand down at the moment. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before the committee and to provide APA's input to your inquiry into the future of Australian aviation. My name is Murray Butt and I am currently the President of the Australian and International Pilots Association. APA represents over 2,200 Qantas Group pilots that fly for Qantas Mainline, including Qantas Long Haul, Qantas Short Haul, Jetstar, Express Freighters, Qantas Link and Network Aviation. I am joined in our Sydney office today by Vice President Barry Jackson and in Adelaide by Dick McCarris, our Technical Safety and Regulatory Affairs Advisor. Both Barry and I come from general aviation background. I've been with Qantas for 34 years and Barry has been with Qantas for 33 years. Being from general aviation meant that we invested a lot of money training ourselves such that we were attractive to airlines like Qantas. Once in Qantas, we undertook training that took us from second officers to captains and we have been captains with Qantas for over 20 years and are currently on the A380 aircraft. That pathway was the aspirational pathway for many Australian pilots in what was a generally thriving aviation industry. COVID-19 has taken most of the loss of our industry and those who rely on it for their livelihoods. We are currently stood down indefinitely and the A380s are parked in Victorville in California. These aircraft are a significant investment for Qantas and it is unclear when or if they will come back to Qantas. The fact that Qantas have granted 12 A380s really highlights the impact this international pandemic has had on international aviation. Both Barry and I are like the majority of Qantas staff stood down and are currently forced into secondary employment. With me driving buses and Barry driving trucks. Many have struggled to find alternative employment in a fairly desperate market. Globally, over 50 airlines have become insolvent during the last 12 months, including Virgin Australia. Over 500,000 jobs and over a trillion dollars of revenue has been lost. They are direct losses. It must be remembered that the International Civil Aviation Organisation has stated every job in the aviation sector generates six jobs elsewhere in the economy and every dollar earned in the aviation generates a further $3 in the economy. Prior to the pandemic, Qantas generated $15 billion directly and a further $45 billion indirectly for the Australian economy. Clearly, this committee is acutely aware of how critical a viable and vibrant aviation sector is to Australians' interests. 
COVID-19 has exposed all the vulnerabilities of our historical approach to nurturing Australia's aviation capabilities. International connectivity has all but ceased to exist in either direction. Our domestic connectivity is fragile and hostage to inconsistent and uncoordinated state government actions, where the politics of public health are destroying local economies and livelihoods. This cannot be the way of the future. It is time that the Australian Government turned its mind to the importance of aviation capacity within our own sovereignty. We haven't had a Minister for Aviation since 1984, and it shows. As we have seen in the Australian shipping sector, it is important that our capability is maintained and in fact should be bolstered by government support to ensure that we cannot become hostage to connectivity decisions of other countries. We must be able to bring our citizens home from overseas and also be able to support the Australian military in times of crisis, as Qantas especially has done in the past, including Vietnam, Vietnam support, Cyclone Tracy and the Bali bombing. It is time Australia took a broader view of the assets it has in its country, which are its people, with a worldwide reputation for producing renowned aviation professionals. Australia risks relinquishing control of its supply to foreign influences. We are guilty of entirely missing the point of sovereign capability. Since the pandemic started, many countries have supported their aviation industry to a greater level than Australia. We have seen Singapore invest over 20 billion Australian dollars into its airline. The US has been supporting the aviation industry such that all airline staff have been on 75% of their salary. The UK, 80% of their salary, and New Zealand is paying its airline staff 50% of their salary until 2022. They recognise the importance of the sector and the retention of skills crucial for their infrastructure. As you know, roughly 13,000 Qantas staff have been stood down unpaid. Australia has invested very little in this sector over a long period, and we would hate to see many bright young women and men leave the industry permanently because of the lack of support by both the industry and government. Whether it is apathy or a philosophical bent that the market will always find a way, Australia runs the risk of joining those countries who, in the absence of sovereign capability, rely entirely on the whim of other nations to service our needs. Thank you. Thank you, Captain Butt. And I must apologise, Captain Jackson. How are you? I can see you on the big screen now. When you're up in the oh, corner, well, I didn't recognise you. I might have to wheel out one of my blue singlets for you, eh? Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> can, can I just add that I've just worked six months for Australia Post driving packages around Australia, and I can assure you that that volume has gone through the roof. Yeah. And uh, what you'd probably uh, underestimate is every 380 that flies across the Pacific carries 10 tonnes of freight in, uh, you know, along with its passengers and baggage, and that's not happening anymore. So obviously those packages have got to go somewhere and invariably they're on UPS, FedEx or uh, Atlas. So, uh, you know, this, that, that probably plays into the fact that, uh, you know, we'd need our own sovereign uh, capability of carrying both freight and passengers in and out of this country. Yep, yep, thank you. Now, did you wish to say anything, Captain McCarris? If not, I know you're never short of a word. I sorry, but I... oh, come on, come on, Senator. <laughs> well, look, what I, what I might, if if you do, please feel free. Otherwise, I will go to to uh, Mr. Steve Pervenus and welcome him. Oh, so, you, Senator. Uh, hello, hello, Mr. Pervenus. I'm going to get you to um, state your name and the capacity in which you will appear today, and then give you the opportunity for an opening statement. Uh, yeah, my name is uh, Stephen Pavanis, and I'm the Federal Secretary of the Australian Licensed Aircraft Engineers Association. Fantastic. And would you like to make an opening statement? Yeah, I've uh, just got a few things to say. I, um, I was madly writing a paper this morning that uh, I hope you've had, had an opportunity to read. Uh, it's not too long, so you might have been able to. Um, I represent the Australian Licensed Aircraft Engineers Association. We've got 2,000 members across the country. We had 2,600 up until the start of COVID, but uh, so many of them have lost their jobs, which is very disappointing. Uh, I'm, uh, our association is apolitical. We're not aligned with any uh, political party, although we have uh, at times had uh, some of our members um, 
run uh, in Bob Catter's party, and we've uh, we've been uh, we've given some support before to uh, Nick Xenophon as well. Uh, I've been secretary of our association since 2006, and. Uh, Despite the youthful looks, um, I am actually Australia's longest serving national secretary at the moment, so uh, um, hopefully that uh, adds some weight to what I have to say. Um, personally, I'm not a member of any political party. Uh, I've voted for everyone and uh, um, I've even voted for the One Nation Party when I was younger, but uh, I won't be anymore. Um, I don't think I really need to sit here and explain to the senators, the impact of COVID. I mean, obviously, it's been devastating for av aviation. Uh, I've, I'll just touch on a few little personal stories and issues uh, for, our, for our members. What, what they've been facing, by and large, has been sporadic work. Uh, um, part like, uh, It might be the case that they've got one month on and one month off, or in some cases, people have had a one month's work over the whole 12 months of COVID. Uh, just. Um, on a personal note, just about aviation and the people who work in our industry, it's a very close-knit group and we all know each other. And what really, what really saddens me is watching friends who have both partners or the couple both work in aviation and how it's impacted them. Mm. And as a, as a union leader, quite um, oh, from time to time anyway, uh, pe people say to me things, things like, oh, well, it's OK for you. You just work for the union. You're not losing any money. It's not a problem. But our, our aviation community, it, we're all linked and it hurts us all. And my partner has personally been affected by this. She's a flight attendant with Qantas and hasn't had any flying or regular paid work for 12 months. So it's difficult for all of us. Uh, the, look, I, I understand the purpose that we're here today well if it's not your purpose, it's going to be mine, is to try and get JobKeeper extended in aviation. And I think that's important. But uh, I was putting together our submission this morning and um, I was typing away on my computer and uh, something popped up on my newsfeed. And I just want to read it to you. I didn't go to the article, but it says, Frydenberg hints at post-JobKeeper support for aviation. Now, I know our Federal Treasurer, Josh Frydenberg, is a Carlton supporter, but I don't trust him. And I'll tell you why I don't trust him. Because I've seen what's happened with JobKeeper. I know the side deals that must have gone on to have it operate the way that it has. I know that people are having pay delayed from one pay period to the next pay period. And the airlines have grabbed that money and kept it. They've kept their JobKeeper. Uh, in the case of aircraft engineers, they get their pay in one fortnight, their shift penalties in the next one. They've had their job keeper taken out here and their job keeper taken out here. And we have a federal treasurer who I suspect has been wheeling, wheeling and dealing with airline managers. They're probably behind closed doors now trying to work out how they can carve up the next piece of pie so they can keep it for themselves. I sit there watching Qantas and their annual general meeting and their reports and here we are, every single worker in aviation is struggling to feed their families. And what do Qantas do? They announce executive bonuses. The executive bonuses were because they didn't lose as much money as they thought they would have through COVID. Fantastic. We've got people who haven't even had a paycheck for 12 months, and Qantas are announcing bonuses. So uh, I ask that this committee be mindful if there is going to be any extended help towards those people who work in aviation, that the help should go to those who work in aviation, not those who uh, award themselves bonuses and uh, other bits and pieces that, uh, uh, that they use the loopholes in the legislation previously created to uh, benefit themselves. Uh, that's about it, uh, Mr Chair, uh, if you have any questions. Yes, there are questions. Uh, did you have any questions, Senator McDonald? Sure. Thank you, Senator Shell. Good. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, thanks, Senator. Um, have a significant proportion of pilots and aircraft engineers um, left the industry? What's the, what's the amount? You, you mentioned a figure before, um, Mr. Venus. Um, and I'll, I'll also, if you could just add any other further comment to that, and I'll go to the pilots. And also, if job keeper, if there isn't such a thing as say aviation keeper which is directly related to keeping employer, employees 
with an obligation for the employer to keep employees connected, what is the likely outcome of you know, further job losses? So what other job losses has there been? And I don't know if you've already mentioned it. What is the future likelihood of job losses uh, if Aviation Keeper isn't uh, maintained? Well, well, I can't speak on behalf of the pilots. Um, no, they're in front of us. So yeah, a, yeah, I understand. But uh, as for the aircraft engineers, it played out like this. Um, and I, I speak mainly of the big three airlines that uh, are in operation, but this, this is playing, playing out across the entire spectrum or, um, or field of uh, aircraft engineering. And probably the easiest one to explain is Qantas. And Qantas announced, um, announced uh, job cuts, and they all appear in our written submission. Uh, um, for example, in Sydney, they wanted to get rid of 170 licensed aircraft engineers, and ultimately 175 put their hand up. Uh, in other places, I think, uh, from memory, uh, they might have wanted 18 to go in um, Melbourne and 40-odd put their hands up. So what's happening is that with half-decent redundancy payouts that are part of our enterprise agreements at Qantas, essentially anyone over the age of 58 would have had rocks in their head not to take a package because they can access their super at 60, at 58, they're going to get paid up to 90, 95 weeks pay as a redundant, redundancy payout. And with, with such uncertainty in the industry, there's nearly been an entire clean out of all those who are 58 and over. So uh, in uh, our membership uh, of the ALAA, uh, as I've put in our paper, we had 2,600 members at the start of last year. Uh, we have 2,000 now. So that's 600 licensed aircraft engineers who've lost their work. Uh, there are other unions who represent unlicensed engineers and they may have lost 400 too. So there may, may be 1,000 aircraft engineers who are no longer working in our industry. And it is not like, it is not like uh, oh, it's going to pick up again, let's grab some more aircraft engineers. Where are you going to get them from? It took me, uh, I, was, I started at the age of 16. I got my first licence when I was 30. Uh, it, uh, it took me 150 exams to get the qualifications that I, I hold to, uh, to be licensed on four aircraft types. And uh, it is, it is uh, quite unusual for anyone under 25 to be licensed. And we have lost so many. And despite the number that we've lost, like I said, mainly anyone over 58 is gone, the average age of our members is still 49.9. Uh, there, there's going to be a lot more retire in the coming years and if people lose, leave this industry because COVID gives them too much uncertainty and there's no support from them for them from the government, we won't be able to replace and replenish as we will need to as COVID leaves us. There's going to be, aviation is going to bounce back to where it was. It'll probably be There'll probably be a greater need. I know, uh, I know quite a few friends who are itching for a holiday. Um, but there won't be any aircraft engineers there if uh, we don't do what we need to to well, we're uh, keep them. Not Australian based. Not Australian based. I think oh, I sort of touched on that in my submission. Yeah. This this idea that um, we've lost everyone over 58. There's a shortage of people. Uh, by uh, my statement that our our average member is 49.9. That's a global. That's a global phenomenon, and in uh, a Boeing paper that forms uh, attachment two of our submission, uh, there's a Boeing document that I've put there that has all of the worldwide shortage proje projections, and in the Asia-Pacific region, we're talking about 253,000 new aircraft engineers are going to be needed over the next 20 years. The number of apprentices Qantas take on, we're not going to come... We need about 12,000 over 20 years on the projections that Boeing have. And I know when I started my apprenticeship in 1986, the Qantas Group had 250 first-year apprentices. Now, Qantas will go out and put a press release and say, oh, look, fantastic, we've put 25 new apprentices on. One-tenth of the amount that they were putting on in 1986, our industry is going to be bereft of the talent that they need and the experience and knowledge and the whole industry will suffer and will not be able to recover post-COVID if we don't do something to keep people attached to their current employers. So thanks for that. So you, you, the, if uh, JobKeeper isn't... Um, so there's been a question raised regards training uh, in previous hearings and again today. Um, 
Is it a question of one or the other, or is it a question of both? Does there need to be JobKeeper for people to be able to afford to stay in the industry? And, does it and is there a requirement for training money to also be put into the industry to be able to continue the skills of workers that are already there and further upgrade their skills? You made that point um, that it took uh, a, a number of years and 150, if I get it correct, 150 exams to, from the age of 16 to 30 to be able to get a, become a licensed engineer. So there's an ongoing skill requirement for people through industry. It's not a, so like turning a tap on and off for these skills. When it comes to training in our industry, uh, what, what has been really sad to witness has been the way that um, the stand-ups, and if uh, I assume you guys will know what the stand-ups mean when it comes to getting stood back up off off being stood down and being allocated some work again. What, what has really disappointed me with, with the aircraft engineers, and in our submission I talk about at Qantas a person being offered one month work in the past 12 months, yet there are some who've been offered quite a bit of work, more than, more, more than half of their period has been at work. The engineers who have been offered little or no work tend to be those who don't have as many licences, and with Qantas having having grounded the A380s, uh, having retired the 747-400s, little or no work for the 787s and progressively more work up to, from the A330s up to the 738s which fly domestically and which are uh, nearly all flying again. But if you had certain licences, there was no work for you. And um, it has been a problem that uh, started before COVID with training shortages, uh, not enough people being licensed to, uh, to cover cases or things that may come up in the future. So uh, if, if there was some funding for training, that, that could only assist those who are on the bottom end of the allocation of work. And uh, sorry, uh, uh, Senator Sheldon, what was the second part of your question? about training and... Uh, and also, um, the, there's been a question raised whether there should be um, training, money should go to tra training, or whether money should go to JobKeeper, or is there a requirement to have both operating to keep uh, and sustain skills within the industry? I've spoken to... I was on leave up until last week, and uh, uh, since I've come back, I've been extremely busy, but I've had a number of chats with some of our members, and they are desperate for money. Grown men on the phone crying because they can't pay their mortgages. They don't know how they're going to feed their families next. The immediate concern for our members is that they do not lose the JobKeeper that they get. That is the only thing. They've, they've extended as far as they can the uh, mortgage repayments and they've done everything. They're getting desperate. Uh, the immediate concern uh, for our members is to make sure that that JobKeeper payment doesn't cut off uh, later this month. And uh, that's, uh, that's, go that's the main message that I impress upon you uh, with my words today. Uh, then just uh, go to um, Captain uh, Butt um, and similar question. You know, what's the, um, you know, the consequence of you know, the talent drain um, if we don't have, um, if and there's been, as I said before, a suggestion that there be money put into training for existing workers some are suggesting that money be put into training for new workers. Um, and of course, um, if JobKeeper is not maintained, what, what, what do you envisage as the existing um, challenges for pilots? And you touched on this in your submission uh, in your opening comments, but what's the challenge for the future um, as we go beyond March? The cliff. Uh, thanks, Senator. I'll just defer to Captain Jackson for that answer. Yeah, Senator, look, I, I think, um, the, the circumstance surrounding, uh, obviously, uh, Steve mentioned the uh, demise of the 747, in addition to uh, the basic grounding of the 380, uh, 200 pilots took a, a package, uh, another 200 were some forced onto leave without pay because there was no useful work. Uh, the alternative was to be made redundant. Um, but the fact of the matter is the problem we have uh, is the uh, infrequent work. I mean, uh, a lot of our um, members have been asked to come back to work, uh, and the question was asked, "How long for?" And uh, you know, is one month? Is it two weeks? Uh, invariably, it's just uh, a minimum of four weeks, and then stood down. 
So they've made the call to say, well, no, I'm happy to stay in my secondary employment, bearing in mind that some of those jobs uh, pay a consistent uh, and uh, realistic salary that is uh, ongoing, and uh, they, they feel that they've made a commitment to that secondary employer. Um, as far as training is concerned, I think that's essential. Um, I, I use the antidote that uh, I've, I've certainly been flying all my adult life, and this is the longest I've been, been away from flying airplanes, so skills will degrade. Um, the longer you leave it, the, particularly as you're old like me, uh, the, the amount of training needed is, is uh, increased, and so therefore the cost uh, to stand us down beyond 12 months is going to be eye-watering for the company. As far as uh, I think it's essential that uh, pilots be kept recurrent, uh, I think that's a, a, an important factor, but I think also uh, in, in the back of a lot of our uh, younger members who have uh, young children, mortgages, uh, and I'm on uh, the, the um, board of a, a mutual bank, uh, the regulator is basically cutting a line at the end of March, which means that there is no extension and there is no um, uh, no special treatment to the aviation sector. So that's adding additional stress to people's lives that they don't need uh, in regard to where they're going to pay or where they're going to find the money to pay their mortgages. So it's a combination, but I think I'd certainly like to see the training where pilots keep their skills up to date, but more importantly, they, it, it needs to be paid in some form or we have a, an extension to JobKeeper so they can remain in the industry and not these are young, you know, smart young men and women who can find jobs elsewhere. They can move into the corporate sector. They can go back to uni. They can do. Uh, they can requalify themselves, and and again, that just adds to the. Uh, and and I will add that out of those 200 pilots, over a third of those were training captains, and one was as young as 47. So a lot of those people have chosen at a young age to leave the industry, which is a tragedy given the uh, given the proud history we have in this country and the, the fact that we live in the biggest island continent in the planet, in the middle of the Pacific. I think I'll, I'll put a question to, to both of you. I'll start with Mr. Bavina. So, um, this question just before you go, Senator yeah. Sheldon, just yes. before you go, Absolutely. just on that issue, um, there's an additional consideration, and that is that, that, or at least in my mind, and that is that we really lag badly um, in terms of training for future shortages. So. While we're dealing with a, an immediate issue with COVID-19 right now, and, and, and so the, the aviation keeper slash how to keep people in touch problem, we also have the situation where um, the brain drone, if you like, is going to be lost to the industry that really should be ramping up its training for the next wave. Because when we get through this pandemic and start to expand again, we'll be starting from nothing because the, the support agencies uh, virtually doing nothing as well for training. So there are several stages in my mind about how we need to address the training issue that you identified. Short term, intermediate and a longer term strategy. And that sort of goes to a question. There's been a lot of talk about there is or there isn't an aviation plan. Do you feel that there's an aviation plan? No. Mr Venus? I remember uh, years ago when uh, the Labor Party were holding government uh, meeting with uh, senators and members of parliament about an aviation plan that was being put together. I don't recall any invites uh, from the current government to uh, talk about such matters, though. There okay. is one. I mean, yes. the point about that, Senator Sheldon, is the reason I was blunt about saying no um, is the fact that, that there's a current inquiry, as you know, or a, a consultation with the Department of Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and Communications about the future of aviation as well. But the reason I said there's no plan is the fact that the previous aviation policy was firmly rooted in the idea of a viable and, and growing industry. There was no, there's nothing in that plan, and as far as I know, there's nothing in the future plans that built any resilience into the capability of the aviation industry to survive these sorts of huge disruptions. And that's why I say there's no plan. You can't have a plan without contingencies and without resilience. And, and what sort of um, contingencies and resilience would you envisage a plan should contain? 
In this particular case, we're going to have to consider the fact that state governments can kill the aviation industry in a heartbeat when they decide to close their borders. Um, we have to deal with the fact that, that in certain of our international markets, things can happen that affect either one country or a series of countries that can um, affect our connectivity there and our capability. Um, the, the fact of the matter that I believe in Australia, we've got an over-reliance at the moment on, on road. We've absolutely undermined the value of rail freight. Um, we've created, if you like, a, a situation where aviation has to be the, the freight backstop in, in certain circumstances, but we don't. We haven't done anything about guaranteeing that capacity. So from, from that perspective, the contingencies that we need to consider are not the normal individual companies falling over, but, but the pandemic has shown us, for instance, that there are statewide and, and nation, nationwide uh, events that can disrupt our connectivity. So they're the sort of contingencies that need to be considered and, and I believe we need to look at how we then manage our capability to best survive those circumstances and not necessarily by, in this particular circumstance, we clearly had to provide lots of financial um, support measures. But that's not the only solution. There are other solutions if we had planned better for um, disruptions up to this uh, level. So I might just sort of ask you that question, a leading question on that then. What, what are those plans that could be, you know, uh, I know you've touched on it already in, in part of your answer, but what are those plans that um, you would envisage that they would, some concrete plans? And I also just raised the question, um, when the, um, and raised by Captain Jackson, and that is that the future of aviation and job opportunities um, post COVID, um, you know, what's, what's the plan required from that? If we're going to take advantage, um, as Mr. Bavina said, of the case of the engineering industry, uh, license engineering, uh, tens of thousands of jobs that are available in the region and in the country, what do we need to do for pilots? Um, I think there's, there's a couple of angles. One, one is obviously um, we have to ensure as best we can that, that we have viable um, um, aviation companies in the sense that, that there's a whole raft of stuff about how, how do we make the industry more um, viable in terms of, of the imposts of government, et cetera, that are on it. That's, that's pretty widely canvassed in the, in the departmental inquiry and it's also part of the issue that came up in your GA inquiry about how do we deal with these sorts of things because the sort of things that affect GA actually affect the airline industry as well, they're just in different areas. So from a point of view of, um, th there's two issues with, with aviation training for the future. And one is quality and, and the other one is quantity. So you've got um, the issue of making sure that as a result of this particular pandemic issue that we don't reduce our standards of training. All right, we need to, we need to maintain the quality of our training and we need to look at, in terms of throughput, we need to be able to make the piloting game more attractive than it currently is. In 2010, when we addressed the Senate, the same committee about pilot training and airline safety, we made the point that airlines and the way that they treat pilots as a mere commodity, as they do with lamies and, and flight attendants and whatever, that commoditization of people means that they then, as Barry said, they, they look at alternative employment and say, okay, what would I rather be? Would I rather follow a pathway that can leave me $250,000 in debt before I get my first job um, and leave me in a situation where um, I think I've got permanency of employment, but no, I don't because I have to start on casual work or part-time work or, or whatever. So there's a whole range of issues, I mean, that need to be discussed. I don't have all the answers because, frankly, they're, they're all complex problems. But I think that we need to at least look at the circumstances and say, all of, for this aviation system to survive, it needs all these elements. And we need to pre-plan the numbers and the training and the standards that we need to do that. And in some cases, we might need to be a bit innovative about how we provide those opportunities. 
in terms of employment, immediate employment. The other issue that goes with it is we probably need to negotiate some some processes around how we deal with things like pandemics and all the rest of it. In other words, can we have the situation where a state wants to um, limit the number of people come into it, but we can keep the airline system alive? Can we operate airports in isolation from the general population so that we can keep freight alive? Um, you know, can we handle quarantine differently? There's a whole range of issues that, that, that come up here and we don't have time to explore in detail, but I just thought I'd throw them into the mix anyway. Mr. Venus, did you want to add anything from an engineering point of view? And I'll, I was going to then hand over back through the chair to Senator MacDonald. Uh, yes, Senator. Look, uh, if you just was to ask a simple question, uh, what do we need in uh, engineering uh, to have a viable future? Apprentices and lots of them. At the moment, with the lack of uh, uh, a future for our industry here because it hasn't been replenished from the bottom, one, from the bottom up, the answer from CASA is always the same, cut standards. And that obviously cuts safety. And I've got a good example of something that uh, it very clearly demonstrates the standards that I've seen cut in the last 15 years. So I, think, I think it might have, uh, actually the last 10 possibly. Uh, airlines like Qantas, they used to go over and above. And uh, we used to check an aircraft every time it came through. We'd go around, check the tyres, check the brakes, go upstairs, talk to the pilots. And Qantas and other, other sim similar commercial carriers decided they don't want to check the planes anymore because they wanted to get rid of staff. Don't want to check them anymore. We want to apply the GA standards. And the GA standard check was a daily check. And then the airlines, they introduced this new idea of let's just check the planes once a day. We'll do that. And of course, CASA said, no worries, go ahead. Just check them once, once a day, like they do the light aircraft out bush. Uh, but then, uh, then they took it further. They wanted to get rid of more engineers or not replenish from the bottom up. So they said, well, wait a minute, if we have to do a daily check, can't we just do it once every two days? Because the plane might sit on the ground and not be used for another day or a day and a half. Uh, yep, no worries, check your planes every second day. But they weren't happy with that, were they? Now they've got approval from CASA to check the planes once every three days. A walk around check on those aircraft once every three days. I started off, or well, when I was checking the planes before I left into my role, we were checking them every single transit. Now they check them once every three days because CASA just continue to give them a go ahead. And you see that because uh, Qantas do have a lot of influence with CASA. The acting uh, CEO at the moment is an ex Qantas manager. And uh, I uh, am concerned that if we don't have apprentices and people coming up through the, uh, through the system, we lose people because of COVID, because they can get more money out of Bunnings than they can sitting around waiting, waiting for a call to come into work. I'm concerned that the call will go through to CASA and CASA will rubber stamp another change, cut training standards, cut the checks that need to be done on aircraft. And it will eventually lead to something that we don't want to be talking about. On that, then, Senator McDonald, and your favourite topic of CASA, have you got any questions? Well, I do. This is the first time I've ever heard of CASA being approved for cutting regulation and making it easier for uh, for anything to happen. So, <laughs> I'm. And you've um, got the captains laughing too. Yeah, exactly. Yes. So, uh, look, can we start with engineers? Yes. Um, uh, and, and I guess, you know, I'm really conscious of the, of the challenges that you've got right now, um, but moving forward with this future of aviation um, element of what we're talking about, uh, LAMIs across regional Australia are rarer than hen's teeth, and it's now leading to the closure of, you know, charter operators, small business, um, helicopter mustering. They're beside themselves with how difficult it is. Is there a problem with how we're training kids at school to get them started to get into the program. Uh, I, I don't know, and I wondered if you could help me, because I agree with you that it's the lack of a good um, funnel of, of people coming into the industry with those skills. It's really make it very hard for aviation to go forward. I know when I secured my apprenticeship, it was with Australian Airlines, and there was, there was 50 first-year apprentices mm -hmm. and Qantas who were separate at the time, had 200. Mm -hmm. uh, there were 3,000 applicants for the 50 jobs. And 
what I'm hearing today is that when the apprenticeships get advertised, and it's a far lesser number, mm. they don't get many applicants. Mm. I don't know why. I don't know why people don't want to enter this fantastic uh, profession where you can work through the night and come out in the, at 7 a.m. in the morning with Skydrol and all other types of oils all over you. I can't work out why people don't want to enter. But we used to, we used to have a large number of applicants for those things. And then you talk about the bush and the smaller operators and regional flying and we have, we have members at the main airlines and we have members in the regional airlines too. And, the, and I do feel for the operators of small planes, uh, one man operation uh, or one, one aircraft operations, I don't know where they get their licensed aircraft engineers from because what happens is the salaries offered at the commercial airlines are invariably higher than what a private charter operator can offer for someone to work in Karatha or where, wherever it may be. Mm -hmm. So there needs to be a rethink of the apprenticeship structure and the incentives offered by the government. And I, I talk to you now not trying to encourage you to give money to people who are members of my union, I'm talking about people who are well beyond the years, in years to come they might be members, but that's where you need to start. You need to invest your training money in the youth mm. and those people we need to attract. Mm. Uh, I asked the Secretary just to take specific note of this because I, I'm desperately concerned about how we keep planes of all sizes, planes and helicopters of all sizes in the air if we don't have a training program that's being filled with young people to, um, to take on these jobs. Um, uh, I think there's some other elements too. I mean, in Cloncurry, for example, the, the apprentice has to be away for uh, up to 20 weeks of the year for training because there's not somewhere local, so they've got to, you know, um, I think 20 weeks is right. I'll, I'll have to go back and check it, but it's very problematic for the business who doesn't yeah. have somebody else who can come in and, and help. Oh. But anyway, um, can I now turn to the pilots and ask you the same question? Um, flying has long been a, you know, it's, it's a calling for some people and... Uh, how, how are you going with attracting people to the industry? I know that we have less and less flying schools in Australia, or certainly not flying schools that are owned by Australians. Is that a problem for um, young people coming into the industry? Uh, Senator, I think the big problem for young people is, and it applies to engineers as well, is the aspiration. Um, you don't go into our industry with the aspiration of uh, flying circuits at Bankstown. Everybody wants to be an airline pilot. Yeah. Um, the same with uh, engineers. They want to be an engineer with a large company like Qantas. The problem is that they don't see those opportunities anymore because uh, there, there are so many opportunities out there that they have as an alternative. They don't start young people anymore through apprenticeships until they're older and the wages that they have to pay to make that competitive aren't attractive to a 18 or 19 year old that has to live the life of an 18 or 19 year old. Uh, in terms of pilots, uh, airlines have always presumed that it is up to the young person to get all the qualifications and they'll just be an endless supply. Uh, up until the start of this COVID, it was worldwide shortages planned going forward for the aviation profession. People just aren't interested anymore in um, the risk of, as Captain McCarra said earlier, outlaying up to $250,000 with no guarantee of a return. Yeah, well, look, I can add to that. I, I um, have always very, very fear, well, I fear that uh, this will be a rich person's job and I, being a country kid from New England and then my apprenticeship out at camel wheel and mustering cattle, it, oh. it is, it, it, that was the traditional uh, path that a lot of the general aviation people did and of course the Air Force is, if the bar's set higher, there's return of service, there's all that sort of stuff. But uh, yeah, I just fear that the, you know, it will be a rich person's game. 
it's something that uh, I hold dear to my heart that, that this should be for anyone or everyone. Mm. Now, how you do that is, is difficult because the only way these days into uh, flying through the airlines, and of course now a lot of young men and women are seeing the airlines shut down and a lot of pilots being out of work, uh, maybe that's putting them off. However, they will have to uh, entrench themselves into a cadetship, which will mean that they will have to, they'll have a, an attachment, uh, a set of gold uh, handcuffs uh, to that airline for however long it takes to, to pay off that training. And uh, are they willing to go down that path? I know that I've got you know, adult kids that have got uni debts as well. But, you know, the pilot training um, is an expensive exercise. Flying aeroplanes is, is the expensive part of it. Not all of it's going to be covered by a hex. So, so therefore, the cadet ships are the only uh, viable option. But then you, you're, uh, you're entrenched into an airline. If we have, I, I, hopefully we won't have another COVID-19 mm. disaster, that, um, that that career will grow and hopefully people will uh, save up their shekels and, and go flying and we'll see a boom in the coming years when this is dealt with. However, I, I still see uh, a, an incentive or a problem with the incentive for people to get into the sims. Mm. I'm, I'm interested in your experience because it is the very story that you're telling that, um, you know, I'm doing a general aviation inquiry, a uh, separate inquiry to this one, uh, because I'm desperately worried about uh, because there's now so few charters and, and um, mustering helicopters and, and, and planes and, you know, for a whole range of reasons. And whilst that's not the, the big end, which is what you're a part of, but, you know, you started, that was the throughput, and I, was, I would imagine that it's made you a terrific pilot because you know how to fly, which is a little bit different to learning now, anyway, that's a hobby horse of mine. But I, I do think a lot about this. I'm, I'm very, very concerned about the, about all sectors. You know, whether it be engineers or pilots or, or GA or charter, um, mid tiers or airlines. You know, we're all uh, they all feed off each other in some way, and um, and so it's important that going forward we do have a comprehensive plan for aviation. It's so important in a big country like ours. So. Um, uh, there is a, uh, an aviation um, strategy uh, paper that the Department uh, of Infrastructure is is um, working on, and so is you know you've already said that, um, as the engineers you haven't been invited to have input into that. What about the Pilots Association? Have you have you had input into the uh, white paper? strategy document? I just can't quite remember the exact name of it. I think it. Dick will talk to that. Yes, we have. And in fact, uh, Senator, we attached our responses to that uh, discussion paper as part of our contribution to this inquiry, um, so that you had both of them. Um, can I go back to your other point about um, incentivising people to, to start in aviation? I think one of the problems that's occurred, and it's happened but very has already referred to it, and that is that back in the, back in the day when, when I was a bit younger, pilots could actually, and I think engineers as well, could get scholarships and other sorts of support measures because their employers invested in their employees. What's happened now is that the employers have transferred all the costs of training onto their employees, and that's why, as Captain Jackson was saying, it's becoming a rich person's game because it's only the people who can afford to stump up that amount of money to get into the game. And we're, when we're cutting off a whole bunch of people um, where traditionally there are some very smart and very capable and very dedicated people who just don't have the financial resources to get into this sort of game. We've got to be able to, to look at how that sort of how that sort of financial support is, is provided. And I think, and it goes to the heart of what Steve was talking about with apprentices, the other thing that comes up is um, we, we uh, sort of lobbied for years to, to get vet help extended into the pilot training or in the aviation training type areas. But I think that we need to review that as well to make sure that, as uh, Terry O'Toole said, that, that the, the support measures are actually targeted at the individual, not, not at rent seeking companies who, who use it as a government revenue stream. Um, and just get a whole bunch of people in on the basis of headcount, and they don't care whether they produce anything or not, so long as they've got the money coming into the government um, yeah, based on the number of students. I mean, 
I think these sorts of support payments need to be tied to the individual so they're released to the supplier on the basis of the person achieving a, a particular milestone. So it doesn't become a, a, fr a free kick to people like Soar Aviation and all the rest of it. Mm, that's, that's a point very well made. And I'm looking at the Secretariat meaningfully that we would take that on on board. It's you know rather than it going to the to the company, it goes to the the student. And I think there's some parts there too. We've heard evidence in other places about um, uh, you know costs of regulation among some of the flying schools that makes the you know just the the the, um, the hours the per hour cost you know to get through just your, your initial stage is so expensive, so. Um, 